This week we spoke to Seamus about the loss of his son. Suicide is a massive issue in our local community and it was important for us to share some awareness on it. It's a very heartbreaking story and it'll be hard for some of you to watch. We wanted to raise awareness and we've included the links to all the local services here so that you can avail of them. They're in the description to the video, so have a look below. Welcome back guys to the Bear Podcast Show, episode 17 with me, Sean Scullion, aka The Handsome Stranger, Owen Mallon, aka The Bear, Aiden, The Face for Radio, Behind the Scenes, and with us today we have Seamus Waits from Balamina. How do you do? Welcome. Thank you. So Seamus, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a chat. We're gonna hear your story. But mm-hmm. for people that's just tuning in now, uh, who is Seamus and where where are you from? So originally I'm from London. Um, I was born in London. I spent nearly every single summer in Northern Ireland with my grandmother in Macrafell. So um, that's where the affinity for like Northern Ireland came from. Uh, I've been living in Northern Ireland now for 25 years. I work for the Simon community uh, in a hostel. And um, I'm a support worker for them. So basically what we do is we, um, people basically who are homeless, they come to our hostel and um, we signpost them to outside services that can um, professionally help them. So yeah, that's basically pretty simple. So, really. so you've been here 25 years and that yeah. accent still hasn't left you? It's part of my identity. I think <laughs> I think if I went around and all of a sudden developed a Northern Irish accent, a lot of people would start raising their eyebrows, you know. Can I ask a question? Yeah. When you go back across the water, does it thicken up? My accent, no, it doesn't. But what I've found is that the phrases that people use here, I use across the water and they don't understand me. Yeah. And that's a bit freaky, like, you know, like we and I and all that sort of stuff. You, it, you know, becomes part of your language. My mum's from Croydon and her accent from the day, now, isn't it? 40 yeah. years she's here and it has mellowed. But what I did realise one time was when we went back, I was like, what? what? This is just like, no. Oh, yeah. but even and, on the telephone, your uh, mum on the telephone. <laughs> like, just literally, it's like a switch flex. But yeah, I mean, I don't sort of like... I. Don't, I slip back into the phrases, like, you know, the London accent phrases, the Cockney accent phrases, but I don't go around going, oh, what, mate, are you, and all that sort of stuff. He's I've, a geezer. <laughs> I've, never, I've never talked like that. So, you know, I mean, well, no, no, I just remain the same, really, you know. <laughs> well, my wee boy wants to know why <laughs> Nanny Silo sounds like Peppa Pig. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, Seamus, we've, we've, we've already divorced. Seamus, you didn't always work for the Simon community, and you, you come over here... Uh, yeah, 25 years ago. So 25 years ago, uh, my wife and uh, my two children, we arrived here and literally within two weeks of arriving, um, I found a job. I worked for a local engineering firm making bus panels for um, to be distributed to write bus. So I did that for, I was actually worked for them for, oh, must be 20, 20 years. And then obviously other things happened which made me basically change my route, you know. Um, I wasn't happy where I was. I didn't want to work there anymore. And I just wanted to do something that I felt was a little bit more worthwhile, you know. Not saying that and being an engineer isn't worthwhile, but to me at that stage, at that crossroads, I decided to make a big change. The One of the reasons for that was because, um, so my son in 2016, he took his own life. It was um, the 28th of May, which was his birthday. He um, went out with his friends, said goodbye and all that sort of stuff, you know. I waved him off and I said, look, you know, basically keep your hands to yourself and behave yourself. Unfortunately, that was the last time I seen Thomas alive. So the next day, um, my wife was at work and this was a Sunday, which was the 29th of May. I'm out in the garden, lovely May day, beautiful, beautiful day, you know, very, very warm. And I had my new grandson over with me and um, his um, mum, Sinead. So I'm in the back garden getting ready for a barbecue. I'm cleaning the barbecue. Next minute, Karen, she arrives home and she says to me, have you seen or heard from Thomas yet? So I said, no, but I said, I know where he's staying. He's staying at a friend's house, which is quite local. 
So to cut a long story short, we heard nothing. I rang him a couple of times. So I decided to go down to where um, his friend's house was. So I went in anyway and um, his friend's dad was sitting out in the back garden. So I said, where's Thomas? And as I looked up at the window, I could see Thomas. So I shouted up to him, you know. I mean, look, you know, he's 21, 22 years of age. I'm coming up now, you know, just in case he had a goal with him or something. You know, I didn't want to embarrass him. So as I went up the stairs, the door of his room where he was staying was shut. And when I opened up the door, that's when I seen my son. And it was, I don't know, it was the most shocking thing I've ever seen. Something no father should ever see. I walked towards my son. I touched him, he was cold. At that point, I knew he was dead. The realisation of all that never sunk in straight away. I'd sort of went into autopilot and basically shouted at his mate, you know, ring ring an ambulance, ring the police. I actually thought somebody had murdered him because I couldn't believe that he could actually do that. You know, I just couldn't believe it. I just thought, no, this isn't, this isn't you. This isn't you. So paramedics arrived. I'd actually given up smoking. <laughs> Strange detail to put in, but I asked one of the paramedics for a fag and he gave me one. I sat on the stairs and the paramedics went in and done their job. Police come in, they brought me downstairs. And then um, I was waiting outside. And that's when I seen my son coming down the stairs in a body bag. That was tough. That was tough. So the next decision, big decision had to be made then. The police said they wouldn't let me drive home. They said, look, we'll drive your car home. And on the way back to the house, they said to me, do you want us to go in and tell your wife? And I said, no, I'm going to tell my wife. So my wife was in the middle of hanging washing on the line. And she seen me pull up in the police car, obviously thought the worst. You know, what's happened? And my wife came towards me and I just told her, I said, Thomas is dead. That's when my whole world shattered. Everything just fell completely apart. I can remember going inside the house and literally for about, it must have been for two hours, I can't remember a thing. I don't know what I did, I don't know who I talked to. So then other people had to be told family relations. My dad lived around the corner and I turned around to one of the people that were there and I just said, look, give me the friend of my dad's. At this stage, I hadn't cried. Um, I was obviously in shock, you know. So I knocked on my dad's door and told him and that's when I just fell apart. I just, yeah, it was, my dad just looked at me. I must say one of the only times that he's actually cuddled me in my whole life, you know. And went back to the house and then things seemed to start moving at a rapid pace. There were people arriving from everywhere, neighbours, you know, God bless them, they all come over, see how we were. Nobody believed in actually what was, you know, being said. What were, you know, what this this was why, why we were in such a state. We had nobody really, you know, because there was only the four of us and my dad. You know, that was us. Kept ourselves to ourselves. Didn't really go out, you know. Went to work. You know, we were, me and my wife were busy raising our family. So, the next, say, 24 hours, I remember standing in the sitting room and I was by myself at this stage and I thought to myself, my first thought was, how can I repair this? How can I make everybody else better? I just want it back to normal again. But knowing that it can never be ever what it was because there was a vital part of our family gone and the most horrific circumstances. Everybody says, you know, you should outlive your children. Of course you should, you know. But this was something that Thomas decided to do. He never disclosed anything to us. We never noticed any mental health, you know, no issues with that. And I remember two days before Thomas took his own life, 
I went up to Thomas's room and I, I sat on his side of his bed. We were close, you know. And I said to him, is everything all right? And he said, yeah. I said, look, you know, you haven't been going out that much. And he said, look, I'm just saving for the holiday in the summer because we were all supposed to be going away together as a family, you know. And he said, no, 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 everything's fine. The next day he went into the town with his mum and shopped for, you know, clothes for holidays, shorts, T-shirts, things like that, you know. So everything was normal. Everything there was nothing to suspect that this was going to happen. So, you know, I mean, you just don't... I've learnt now that you don't take nothing for granted, you know. You, I'm, I'm more observant. I'm more tuned in to how somebody is feeling, you know, because of that, you know. So, unfortunately, the next, like, oh, 48 hours was absolutely brutal. No one knew what they were doing. Nobody, you know, there was nobody, like, I suppose, leading, you know. So again, I decided, okay, I'm the man of the house, the man of the house. I'm saying man a lot here, you see, because this is it, you see. With a man, you're brought up to make decisions. You're brought up to be lent on. You're there, you know. You're strong. You know, you don't show emotions. So I had to go down to the undertakers and arrange this for my, my own son's funeral. And even now when I look back, I can't believe that I did that. You know, I can't believe that I actually did that. But it had to be done. The funeral was massive. It was big. We waked on for three, three days and my wife never left his side. The first night we got him home, we slept in the same room as him because we wanted to be close to him. Sounds a bit morbid and that, but he's our son, you know. And I remember watching my wife sitting at the head of the coffin, repeatedly stroking his hair. That was tough. I couldn't be in the room. I was in and out, ducking in and out, ducking in and out. I just thought, somebody stop this. Send all these people home. Leave me alone. But you follow tradition, don't you? You know, this is what traditionally you are brought up to do. This is how you bury somebody. But this is how you bury somebody who is older. Not your son. So the funeral came funeral went and then after three weeks of my son dying I decided to go back to work hindsight's a wonderful thing I actually call it hindsight because you do what you think is right at the time and I thought I was doing what was right at the time I still had bills to pay I still had a mortgage to pay I still had a family to look after although they were in absolute bits so I went back to work after three weeks big mistake I carried on working then for about another six months and the year went by and then eventually my wife broke down. And she's my wife's got her own story to tell, you know. I'm not going to talk on behalf of my wife because, you know, she's an independent lady and, you know, she's got her own story to tell. But she had a breakdown and I continued... And as time went by, it was been pointed out to me that I was becoming more and more short-tempered. Very hard to, very difficult to be with, you know. But I thought I was just being a man, you know. I thought, oh yeah, I'm being a man. You know, I'm standing up to this. I'm going to get through this. And it was at that point then that somebody pointed out to me, you know, they just said, Seamus, look, you know, something not quite right with you, what's going on and everything else. And I remember being in work and breaking down in work and crying. I was a sprayer. And I used to go into my spray booth, shut both doors, and just cry. I didn't want anybody to see me. I was ashamed, you see. I had this, this thing in, that was built into me, you know, through generations of my own family, you know. I was born in 1962. So when I was brought up, you know, nobody hugged anybody. You didn't do that. Everybody went to the pub at the weekends, got drunk and knocked seven bells a shit out of each other. That was the way it was. You were a man. You didn't show emotion. So that was my background. But I s 
slowly but surely started realising that I was in trouble. And what really brought it to the fore was when I decided to drink half a bottle of whiskey one night. And I put a television cord around my neck. And I thought, right, I've had enough of this shit. I'm done. And I remember, you know, getting into that mindset and saying, right, this is it. Telling myself, this is it. I'm doing this. I'm sick of this. I'm doing this. I couldn't live with the pain any longer, you know. And I didn't know where to go with it. I didn't know who to talk to. I just didn't know. Because nothing like this has never happened to me before. So eventually, I suppose, I'm going to use a word here. Courage. I didn't have the courage to kill myself. I wasn't far enough along. My mental health hadn't got to the point where I didn't care enough about myself. There was still that little bit of light. So I put it down on a rang lifeline. I rang lifeline. Seamus Waits from London, brought up in a hard area, Labrick Grove, rang fucking lifeline. On the phone chatting and everything else are you okay lovely lovely woman and everything else and I said yeah I'm all right now wife came up the stairs and she just looked at me and she said to me you need help and that was that point then I said yeah you're right I do I need help I wasn't processing any of it I was pushing it all down I wasn't letting it out I wasn't you know expressing how I was feeling I didn't know how to I didn't have them skills I was never taught how to do that Like, if somebody punched you in the mouth, okay, if you cried, you were weak. That sort of thing, you know, that's the way that I was brought up as a man. You were tough, you were, you know, you were hard, you know. But anyway, so I got in contact with outside services, as they say. I got in contact with the, um, you know, people who could help me. I asked for help. I had I went to counselling, and that's when my eyes started to be opened. And it took what to take it seriously. It took me nearly a year and a half because when I first went to counselling, I thought I can bluff this the same way I bluffed everything else. I thought I can bluff this. I know what I'm doing. And I remember driving to counselling my first counselling session, and this is mad. And I thought to myself, I've got nothing to say to this person. I don't know this person. And then when I got in there, I verbally vomited all over this poor woman. You know, and when I came out, I didn't even know what I'd said. I couldn't remember a thing. But there was so much locked up inside me, you know, that it just all all of a sudden exploded out. I remember going home, driving home in the car and crying, crying my eyes out. It was the first time I'd really ever cried, properly cried. Because I wasn't supposed to as a man, you see. You don't do that. You don't show your emotions. You carry on. Stiff up a lip and all that bollocks. But anyway. So as that time went by, we had the counselling sessions and all that sort of stuff, you know. And, you know, we started to get into some deep stuff about my background why I react to things the way that I do. But the thing about the counselling is, is it's about you. It's about, it's totally, it's the, it's the first time I'd ever had a chance to actually speak about me, what I felt and how I was coping. And it's the first time that I ever had somebody sitting in front of me that was actually interested in what I had to say. Somebody was actually listening to me for the first time in my life. So as the counselling sessions went on, I started to open up even more, you know. I felt in a safe place. I felt, you know, I was starting to get more confident talking about who I am and what I am. So this went on for about a year and then it stopped. And I felt like an abandoned baby. I thought, oh shit, I'm by myself here again. Then all them intrusive thoughts came back in, you know. All the negative crept back into me, you know all the self-doubt, what are you doing? What are you doing? You don't need this, you don't need this. All the denial came in again. And then I slipped back into the same routine of, like, my temper was getting worse. I was becoming more judgmental. I was becoming 
just basically I was starting to implode again. So I went back and I said, look, this isn't good. My relationship at home with my people that I loved was starting to be not good, you know. So I got more help. And in between all this happening, you see, you're still struggling with the, with the death of your son. You know, you're, you know, this is the person that I love more than anything in the world. He was my, he was my everything. You know, me and him went every, everywhere together. I was a boxing coach, and I coached his, you know, boxing and everything else. And we spent hours upon days, hours together. The relationship between me and Thomas was very natural. We'd laugh, we'd joke, you know. I was very open with him, he was very open with me. But now how much our relationship was open, he never told me what was really going on. He hid it. And that must have been exhausting for him to do that, to carry on. You know, Seamus, that's one of the most heartbreaking things we've we've had and I'm struggling at the minute for questions, but let's talk a wee bit about Thomas and mm-hmm. who who he was and and then then I want to ask you because there was there was a lot of that what you were saying you were supposed to I don't know anybody that that knows what anybody's supposed to do at that point but let's let's talk a wee bit about Thomas what is it, what age was he and and what 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 did he do. So Thomas had just turned 20, he had just turned 22, it was 28th with his birthday and he passed away on the early hours of um, the 29th. So yeah, Thomas was, um, Thomas lived a full life. He um, achieved a lot in a very short space of time. And obviously like, you know, not just because of what he achieved in the boxing ring and all that sort of stuff, but I used to look at him and I, like, he was my hero. He really was my hero, you know. I, I looked at him and I thought, God, you're a good boy, you know. If anybody wished to have a son, he was he was fantastic. He was good looking. He was, you know, everything everything going for him. Fantastic personality, clever, you know. And it's, one of his friends said to me at the funeral, he said to me, I could put 100 men up against that wall and he would be the last person I would have said would die by suicide. And like... And that was said to me a few times. They were everybody was in total shock. But Thomas worked with me for a while in the same factory, and then he took the decision he wanted to join, you know, forces. So I said to him, "Right, okay." We discussed different options for him, you know. And I thought, I thought Thomas had a little bit more about him. So I said to him, well, "What about the RAF?" So he thought about it. He said, "Well, what do they do in the RAF?" I said, "Well, go and research it." So eventually he joined the RAF. He joined the RAF as a gunner. So basically what he was, he was like, you know, basically, you know, he was just, he was in the RAF and he'd done that, you know. And I got a phone call from him and he said, Dad, I says, yeah, what? He says, I'm coming home. So I says, what? I says, you've done all this training you've, and you're coming home. He says, yeah, he says, I'm too young. So I says, right, okay, you're too young. Are you sure? Yeah. Fine, he came home. And he settled into a job. He got himself a good job, you know. He was working for a water company. And um, he was doing really well, you know. And he was just the same Thomas. Me and him used to go to the gym together still, you know. We'd work out together and that, you know. And he was just the same Thomas. There was nothing that I could actually, to this day, put my finger on and say, that is the reason. Because through this journey... You can think 20 different reasons on 20 different days and not one of them make any sense. And the reason why that is they don't add up in your head because he is not here to tell me what really happened. So all they are is assumptions. You think you know, but you don't know because Thomas isn't here. You know, and knowing Thomas as I did, Thomas was a very loyal person. He was... He was gregarious, you know, as in like, you know, he enjoyed physical sports. Obviously, he was a boxer, you know. To my knowledge, he, he wasn't really a risk taker, you know. Every, all his friends, like, said that he was their go-to. When they were in trouble, Thomas was the go-to. That was the person that they went to where he would talk to them and listen to them. And that's the sort of person he was. 
very grounded, very level-headed. You know, a typical boy, you know. And I don't know to this day, and, and no matter how much I research it and look into it, I will never know. Really, I, I will never, ever know. And this is the thing about suicide, you see. Everybody thinks, oh, there must have been a note. It's very rarely that notes are left. Notes aren't left. So there's no closure. It's been what? That was 2016. It's 2023 now. Is that six or seven years? Seven. It's seven years. Six, sorry. Oh, 27. Seven. So it's seven years since, since this happened. It's seven years of pain. The pain continues. You, you live alongside the pain. You can go through each day and the first thing, my first thought in the morning still is, is Thomas. My last thought at night is Thomas. And there'll be different things come into my mind during the day. I'm still at a point where I find it difficult to look at pictures of my son. You know, I have to be in the right frame of mind to do that, even after seven years. Can I sit down and laugh and joke about different experiences that I've had with Thomas sometimes? But they're personal and they're my experiences. If I feel like sharing them, I'll share them. If I don't, I won't. And that's my choice. That's my choice to do that. But, you know... I can see a father and a son playing. And at the beginning, I used to get angry. I used to get envious because I wanted to do that with my son. But my son isn't now. I've got photographs of Thomas, loads of them, but I've got no new ones. They're the same photographs. The thing that you miss is the physicality being able to see him physically and touch him physically and talk to him physically with him answering you back because all you do is you have conversations in your head with him. But he's not answering you back. And I'm going to mention something here, okay, and it's about mediums, all right? I went to a medium because I was desperate to have some kind of contact. I wanted to know that my son was safe and well and was being looked after wherever he was. So I went to a medium and everything else and she basically turned around and fed me a load of old, load of old cod's wallop and I just walked out of there feeling even more shite than when I went in there in the first place. Now I get it that you know people do go to mediums because it gives them some sort of a comfort. But when I, got, when I went home and sat down and thought about it, see if I would have had any contact with my son, a minute wouldn't have been enough, an hour wouldn't have been enough in a day because I would have kept going back and back. And back. And this is the thing about this, you see. You've got to be mindful of this. One contact will never be enough. Because I want him back. To this day, I want my son back. You know, I want him sitting beside me here. I want to do the things that we did. And that's never going to happen. So all I've got, all I've got really is the memories that are in my head. That's what I've got. And they're precious. Then we move on to dreams, dreaming about my son. I've had two dreams in seven years. That's it, two. And I've talked to other people about it who are in the same position as me and they've said the same thing. They very rarely dream about the people that they've lost to suicide. And I don't know why that is. So then we move on now to the afterlife, faith and everything else. I have to have faith. Because if I thought for one minute that I was never going to see my son again, that'd be it for me. What's the point? What's the point in all this? What's the point in the pain and the heartache that you go through as you go through your, you know, as you go through life? If there isn't some sort of place you can go to where you can be together again. So yeah, I've got faith. You know, I've got faith. But not the sort of religious faith that people, you know, stereotypical religions you know I'm not into that crap because I just that's just my personal preference I think there is a there's a there is a higher power you know at work and hopefully you know well not hopefully uh, I want to be with him so that's sort of that bit you know 
That's where you go to. This, these are the places that you go to when you're when you're processing and looking for answers. I read every single book I could get my hands on. I looked up videos of people taking their own lives on YouTube to see how they did it because I didn't know the stereotypical thing about somebody taking their own life is that they hang themselves. <clears throat> I wanted to know how he did it. I was forensic about it. I looked into everything because I'm his dad. I had to know. That didn't really help me a lot. You know. And then there's the images that I carry around in my head of my son. I was the first person to see him when he died. It was me who found him. I raised the alarm. I was there. Was I supposed to? I don't know. But I was. That image is, is embedded into my mind and I do have flashbacks about that and I do go back there. I go, you know, not as regular as I used to, but I still go back there and I can become very low when I'm back there. Obviously, for, you know, them sort of reasons. So these are all things that you have to work through, you know. You have to work through everything, plus the heartbreak. And then you're watching your family. You're watching your family and it's as if you're, you're above them, you know. You're hovering over them. And everybody is falling apart. Everything that you've worked for all your life is falling apart. And I didn't know how to fix it. Because it wasn't up to me to fix it. It was, everybody had their own journey to go on. All we could do was support each other when we were down. Put an arm around each other. And the most important thing is listening, to listen to each other. James, when when you were in that real dark place, mm -hmm. and you were when it was all spiral, a lot of what we got was the pain and torture of of the questions that's left behind, and that and so many people here, and I've met so many people that have been bereaved by suicide. The questions, it's torture. Yeah, it's the unanswered questions, and the fact that the questions are never going to be answered. Yeah, but when things were spiraling and you felt like that, and you had to reach out to Lifeline. Mm -hmm. And so many people are going to listen to this that have lost a loved one by suicide, and they th at the different stages along your journey, which you you'll still continue on. When you were there, and you, and you reached out, and I know that you had this macho, and and that is that's ingrained. That mm -hmm. is that's we, me and you've had conversations before, and we're like that generation. Like we're, we're, we're one gen we're, we're getting softer as we go on but we're not this is what I'm saying this this macho image this image and we can hear it and you beating yourself up that, that you were to do this and you were to do this and you're putting that on yourself it when you reached out for help when when you were at that lowest point when you felt like you wanted to take your own life what what would you say then and people are listening now when you're at that point you decided to reach out. What what was the next stages? What how how did you? Yeah. So basically, as I said, I reached that point. You know, I was at breaking point, and I had I asked myself a serious question: Do I want to carry on living? And do I want to carry on living in a way that is going to be positive? I had other choices to make at the time. I could have, I could have turned to drink. I could have turned to drugs. I could have done anything. And nobody, everybody would have looked at me and said, you know, they, they can't blame God if that happened to me. This, that and the other. But there was something, there was something, I don't know what it was. I can't, it's, this is the part of it I find quite hard to explain, you know. There's no divine intervention here. There's nothing like that. But it's something just triggered in my head. I could see all these other people, like, you know, when I was going to the groups and all that sort of stuff in the same position as me. And I thought to myself, how can I help? What can I do? You know, what is there? I want to know more about this. I wanted to know, again, the reasons why people get to the stage where they're taking their own lives. And the only way that I could do that was basically by going back to school. So I enrolled on a counselling course um, a level four counselling course and that's when things started to really change 
I remember rolling on it and everything else and going there for the first night and I was going to walk out. I thought, what am I doing here? I'm the oldest man in the world. And I'm sitting here in a classroom after, what, 40 years. I was crap at school. Am I really going to like be able to retain this information? And the best part about it was you had to do most of your work on a computer, right? And I'm completely computer illiterate. You know, I worked in a factory. Hang on a minute. You know, what's that thing? It's a black box. I can surf the internet on it and that, but I can't, like, you know, I don't know how it works. Fortunately, I had a daughter <laughs> who knew how everything worked. So basically, she showed me. And for the first, my tutor, if she ever listens to this, is going to kill me. For my first, <laughs> like, three parts of my coursework, I dictated to my daughter and she typed it out for me. This is how, you know, you have to become like a little bit, you know, you use what you've got. Yep. So during the course, I started to realize that this course is about self-development. It's about you. Because the questions that are asked are, you know, you're going back to why you are the person you are. What, you know, what has made you this person that you are? Because we're all born innocent, yeah? And it's our environment, basically our environment that, you know, influences our decisions, our prejudices and everything else. And I didn't realise at the time, but I have more prejudices than, than, you know, than I thought I did. I thought, oh, I'm quite liberal. I, was, I wasn't liberal. I was a fucking dickhead. You know... And then as we went through the course and I started challenging myself even more, you know, challenging my behavior, challenging my thought processes, you know, my negative thought processes and why they were there. And it was, it was, it was a, a result of the environment that I was brought up in and, and, and the era that I was brought up in. That's what happened. And somebody actually turning around and saying to me, it's okay, you can cry. That was a revelation that this was quite acceptable. That it's okay for a man to cry. It's okay for a man to reach out and ask for help when they're in trouble. That you don't have to be this rock, you know. Because if you keep doing that, okay, and you, and you don't get in touch with what's going on inside you, you can't help anybody else because you've still got the same old prejudices and you've still got the same opinions about how a male should behave. So that had to be challenged. That part of my, my belief system had to be challenged. And it was when I started being honest with myself and challenging that part of my belief system, I realized this is good shit. This is good. This is good. And I found myself changing as a person. And then I sat down with myself one night and I did ask myself, why am I doing this? And do you know one of the big reasons why I was doing this? Because I wanted to make my son proud. I wanted him to be proud of me and say, out of everything that's happened, you're going to do something that's useful. You're not just going to curl up in the corner. You're not going to disappear. You're going to, you're going to keep going here. And I wanted my family to be proud of me. But most of all, I wanted me to be proud of me. I wanted, you know, I just needed something in that, at that time and that's what it was. And it progressed from there, you know, I'd done more courses. And eventually I started to um, facilitate at, um, group meetings and everything else. Unfortunately, COVID put pay to that, you know, sort of blew everything up in the air. But when I was going to like, you know, the groups and that, the suicide bereavement groups, I got a lot of help from there because there were people further along in these groups and their journeys. You know, I was a newbie. So there were people further along. And what I discovered was I learned different. I, I, I used to ask questions. Well, how did you cope with this? How did you do that there? And they tell you very open about it. You know, they tell you and they sit down and, and support you. And you break down and cry in the middle of a meeting and they hug you. You know, I'd never had that. This was a complete revelation. It opened my eyes. This twat from fucking North London, like, you know, you know, who was living this lie, basically. I, it was a lie. I wasn't a hard man. I wasn't, you know, strong. I was just me. So it was getting back to that. It was getting back to who I really am. 
and it, I'm still working on it. I'm, I'm still very much working on it. I mean, the groups and everything else. And then I was invited to speak at a couple of things. I think, oh, and you were at them, weren't you? Yeah. I remember doing that and I absolutely shit myself. You wouldn't have known. I, so I was shaking, shaking. So anyway, so I did that, you know, and this was, this was empowering me more and more, you know, this was, this was like, yeah, this is good medicine. You know, I can, I feel that like I'm, I'm giving something back here and I wanted to give so much back because I'd received so much help from so many different people. They'd supported me through my, you know, worst time in my life. And then when COVID really hit, yeah, so I was, I was basically, um, what do they call it again, when they, the COVID thing, when you were laid off? On um, furlough. That's the one, yeah, yeah. I was, I was put on furlough and I you know what, I was praying I was going to go on furlough because I was, I was done, I was tired, you know, I'd had enough. I was doing the courses, doing this and doing that and, I was washed out at this stage. So I had six months furlough. And in that six months, I thought, right, I'm going to start looking for a job that I want to do. I've got my qualifications. I've done this. I've done that. You know, I've got experience. And lo and behold, lying in bed one night, bang, Simon Community, support worker. Money's not bad. That'll do. Lovely. I applied. And to my surprise, I got the job. And if you would have said to me, Seven years ago, you're going to be working in the Simon community as a support worker. I'd have laughed in your face because I had no interest in that part of life at all. My son's suicide changed me completely. Would I like to go back to the person that I was with my son still with me? Yes, of course I would. Would I like to have lived this again all the way through it no I wouldn't wish this on anybody but I just found a niche I found a place for myself I found something that worked for me you know it doesn't work for everybody but it worked for me I'm in a privileged position I've experienced something that not a lot of people have experienced and if I can help anybody and share my knowledge with anybody I will do that if it gets them in a better place If it stops them from doing something to themselves, hurting themselves in some way, I will open up and I will share what has happened to me. And the thing that I've realised is that this journey is my journey and my journey and it's very personal to me. Everybody, this affects everybody in different ways. A man will be affected in a different way because of the relationship that he has with, with with the person, you know, the child that they've lost through suicide. A woman will be infected in another way. And I used to be at home when they're pulling my hair out. You know, what the fuck? Why are you you acting like this? Why are you acting, you you know, hang on, I'm grieving as well here. I'm grieving as well. You know, that sort of thing. And it's because I didn't understand. There's a book, okay, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, I think her name is. And I read that book anyway. It's the five stages of grief. I think. That book was writ in all good faith, you know? But there aren't five stages. Because you don't go one, two, three, four, five. You could go five, three, two, one in the space of an hour. But I think what Elizabeth was trying to do was point out and make people aware of grief stages but not put them in an orderly fashion. I think she was just, you know, I think she was trying to say, right, this can happen. And that book helped me. You go through depression. You go through, like, you can't make decisions. You have memory lapses. Your memory goes. You can't, you know, you get to the stage where I couldn't get out of bed in the mornings. It was an effort for me to get out of bed. I just didn't want to go anywhere, didn't want to do anything. So, and these are the phases you're going to go through. But grief is a very personal journey. I mean, myself and you have talked about that. And it's a personal journey. It's very much what you're going through. And it has to be respected. It has to be, you know, let the person grieve the way that they want to grieve. There's no rule book here. There's nothing, there's no guidelines here. You can be up one day and down the next day. It's It's as quick as that. Sitting with your grief is important. Don't push it away. Let it in. Because 
it's true what they say. The deeper the love, the deeper the grief. So, of course I'm going to grieve all my life. All my life I'm going to grieve. It's never going to go away. But I allow myself to do that now. I allow it to come. And it goes. And it comes. In the early days it was, it was terrible. It was bad. As time has gone on, I'm learning to live beside it. It's part of me. It's part of who I am. And it's because I love my son. That's what it is. I'm on antidepressants and have been for the last three years. That's another story. <laughs> it took me, oh my God, a year before I was fully convinced that I needed antidepressants. And again, I was, it was dragging and screaming. Oh no, I don't need them. I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm okay. No, I don't know. What the fuck do you want to do? La di la di la di la. This is the conversation in your head. And I remember the day I first started taking them. I was afraid of them. Oh my God. I'm a fucking head case. The doctors put me on antidepressants. I'm, what the fuck's going on? And the anxiety I felt of taking that first one. And I'll be honest, it's one a day I take. All right, one a day. And I never slept that night. And then when I eventually went off to sleep and got up the next morning, I asked them fucking depressants. They kept me up all night. They're shite, they are. They're useless. Who the fuck would want to take them? But anyway, I was persuaded and encouraged to persevere with them. Have they made a difference? Yeah, of course they've made a difference. You know, they gave me the ability, that they helped me carry on. They took the edge off what was going on. So regarding men taking medication for their moods and depression and all that sort of stuff, listen, do it. It's going to help you. In the long run, it's going to help you. You're not going to be on them forever because there's another thing out there called therapy, which is counselling. There's all different types of therapy. They go hand in hand. And as you feel a little bit more confident, a little bit more comfortable with how you are, one will be phased out, and eventually, maybe, just maybe, both might be phased out. But even if they're not, don't worry about that. Because the one thing that I've really, really learned is when you're struggling, it's important to ask for help. Put your hand up and ask for the fucking help. Because if you don't, you're not going to progress as a human being. You're going to be stuck where you are. The same feelings, the same prejudices are all going to be there. It's difficult as a man to ask for help, but it's out there. The help is out there. Talk to a, look, everybody says talk to a friend. I sound like a fucking advert. Everybody says talk to a friend. They say, look, talk to it. Yeah, talk to a friend. And I know how hard it is for a man to open up and talk about his feelings because we're very private people, aren't we? You know, we keep it all in here. It's all in here. You know, it's in our heads and it's in here. But eventually you keep too much in your head and you keep too much in your heart and bang. Talk to somebody about how you're feeling, a close mate, your wife, whoever, the fucking bus driver. Talk. Well, the example I give on that is you break your arm, you go straight to the doctor. Yeah. You wouldn't ask another question about it. You'd just be like, I need to go and see a doctor here. Mm -hmm. But you have things going on in your head and it's like, it'll go away. It won't go away. And why not go and reach out and talk to that counsellor? And, like, I think more people should be going to counsellors. Like, the likes of America there. Yeah. Who's your counsellor? Because they're openly, as in, look, a counsellor is a good thing. And me, personally, same thing, counsellor. I'm seeing a counsellor at the minute. Mm -hmm. I'm quite happy to openly say that. And I think it's the best thing ever done. Yeah. Not that I had any thoughts like that going on in my head. But just things that I couldn't reason, like just wee things was going on in my head that I couldn't really reason why I was feeling that way. Mm -hmm. And I went and talked to a counsellor and like literally three sessions and I'm like, different person. Yeah. Feel different person, feel better about myself. And I think that's great. Yeah. Self 
the self awareness journey. Once you start, then she must you touch on when you counselling or you receiving counselling. Once you start working on yourself and you're dialing back and you're like, why why did I react like that? I and mean, then you start pointing out your core beliefs, your the values that made you think like that. Going back to your wee and, and a lot of it was when you're a baby mm-hmm. and a child and you share that full generation. I think of my father. I think of 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 of, of Sean's father. They're all strong men, and that's our perception of strong men. They carry the burden. They don't talk. They don't cry. They don't. You know, there's none of that. There's no feelings, as you say. They, you know, the hugs or or telling someone you love them or you're proud of them. There's it, it's it's not the way it was done. It's not the way, mm-hmm. and that core going into your belief when you're going and you went on that journey and you start dialing that back and you're like that's why and that and, and things become clear. It's a journey that once you start unraveling them things, you you do see things differently and you do process. And then and we were saying to people here, we can't thank you enough for how open and honest you're being here, Seamus, because I I do believe I genuinely hand and heart believe this is going to help so many people. Because the stages of grief, grief never goes away. And it it's the grief of losing someone to suicide is a it's a different intent because the, the questions that, that surround it, the the you question yourself, them, everything that goes around it, there's so much left behind. But learning to to say, Yep, yeah, I have grief and I will grieve my son the rest of my life, mm. but at I am now my life is here and I and I'm gonna continue it on and I'm gonna bring good and I'm gonna make him look down, I'm gonna make him proud of me. The the people are at different stages. Some people aren't ready for that yet. And they're not ready to admit they're not ready for medication. They're not ready for therapy. They just want to be angry and they want to be on their own and they want to be left. People are at different stages and it takes different amount of times and, and we haven't actually said to the people who's watching here, the, I had met Seamus before because my wife manages a bereaved by suicide service, and I've attended the, the groups. I've I've witnessed firsthand Seamus speaking, and I know it was different for me being in them groups. I've spoke to people about this. It was different for me sitting in that group because everyone sitting there is with their stages of grief. I I, I I'm not there because of that I, I'd met some, and I was sitting there, and I was fit to see Seamus when you were talking. I could see people nodding and saying, "I done that." That happened to me. And some were, like, if it was a scale, some were them steps, some were the steps. And some may get there and then come back a bit. And then after, you know, yeah. there's different stages. And and this is why it's so hard, I think, on a relationship. I've seen uh, couples like yourself. It's hard because not, the, not each of you is on the same step. And if somebody's progressing a bit, better and they're feeling a bit better then the other person gets angry because they're not at that point or vice versa there's so many things but we were saying for people here the first point of not the first point of the journey because this we're not saying this there's and the one thing that i have noticed and i have seen the people and we we were there and you're talking and i could see it and the passion and and Obviously, people here, how good of a talker you are and how how much love you have for Thomas is driving you on. But I could see it. People, you were helping people there and you will help people and you'll continue to help people. And you said, to my surprise, the same community, no, 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 absolutely not to your surprise. You were the exact person for that. You're going to have so many people on. But we talk about the, the, the journey of grief. It's not, there's no cure. No. Do you agree? No, there's no cure. Okay, so there's an old proverb, isn't there? You know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, okay? The, the longer you push it away, the more negative effect is on you. At some stage, it's going to come out in some way and it, it can come out in a very unhealthy way as regarding, again, mood changes, temper, Physical health, mental health, this all gets affected. So the longer you hold this in, the longer that, you, you know, because what you're doing is, okay, by grieving you're expressing your love for somebody. That's what you're doing. 
So why are you, ask yourself a question, why are, you de- why are you denying that love that you feel? And why are you denying that you need to express this? Because you do, you need, you need to get this out. <clears throat> if somebody cries in front of me, right, and they've lost somebody to suicide or any death at all, I don't tell them to stop. I say nothing. I just let them do what they have to do. There's no judgment here. And this is the thing. We are, the, look, the hardest people that we are on, on, on us is, is on ourselves. We give ourselves such a fucking hard time in our heads, okay? And I, what I sometimes say is that if you spoke to yourself the way you, sp- and, and then speak to your best friend in the same manner, they wouldn't be your best friend for long, would they? So it's admitting to yourself that you're a, you're, you're a human being, you have feelings, you've got feelings. And it's learning how to express them in a healthy manner and it's being allowed, being allowed the space and the time to express yourself and taking that time. Have a fucking duvet day. Veg out in front of the TV. You don't have to do anything in your free time. You don't have to do anything. And if that's what you want to do on that day, do it. Just do it. Because your mind needs a rest. It needs a rest because you're processing so much. It's like a washing machine up there, you know. There's so much whirling around and whirling around. Was it my fault? Was it this person? Was it that person? Did somebody say something to him? What tipped him over the edge? Da, 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 da. And then the the old nugget. Ha, the killer. Why? I ask myself why and I ask God why. Why didn't you step in and save my son? You're supposed to be almighty and powerful. What have I ever fucking done to you to deserve this? But you see, that was about me, wasn't it? That wasn't about Thomas. I'm talking about myself now. You see what I'm saying? I'm talking about myself. How this is affecting me in my head. Reasoning it out. Is it because I did X, Y and Z when I was younger? Is it because I didn't do this? Why didn't I spot the signs? Boom, 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 boom. All adding to your mental health and never getting the answers that you really want. And the reason again is why you're not going to get the answers because I don't know why. I don't know why. Why me? Why not me? What makes me so different or better than anybody else that this couldn't happen to me? So why, I ask myself, why not me? Why not me? I'm not special. I'm just a normal person. Getting through life the best way that I can, trying to raise my family. It's a tragedy that should never have happened. If it was my decision, it would never ever have happened. But this is the thing, it wasn't my decision. It was my son's decision. And his ultimately. And that was his decision. Who am I to question his decision? Who am I to cast judgment on that? Let the why go. Just let it go. And over time you will. It will go. It will fade into the background. And you'll come to some sort of a resting point with it all it will never be finished it's never done and dusted because there's no closure you see with suicide there's no closure there's no end point you don't get he died because he had cancer he died because a bus hit him he died because this why he was shot he was murdered no you don't get that he died of his own hand so if i turned around to you owen or sean and i said there's a knife there's a knife okay i want you to stick that knife through your arm Go and do it. Every fibre in your body is telling you not to do that because we are self-protecting as a species, aren't we, you know? When we hurt ourselves, we go, ow, or whatever, yeah? So where was my son's mind when he took that decision? I'll never know because I'm not my son and I've never been in that place, thank God. I've never been in the place that he was in. But whatever distress he was going in, At that time, it could be a split second. 
It could have gone, gone on for months. It could have gone on for years. It could have gone on for weeks. But from what I observed from my son is this, that I never seen any signs of mental health. So at that point, something happened, something broke. And that was his decision. So who am I to question my son's decision? I'm not going to disrespect him. That was your decision, son. That's your decision, Thomas. As much as I hate your decision, and I, I completely disagree with it, I can't argue the point. How can I? And that's the thing, you see. You can't. Because they don't come back and tell you. Nobody comes back and tells you why they've actually done it. Somebody might leave a note. That very rarely happens. So you're left there in limbo to wonder why. That's why why has to go. Why is no good. Because you won't know. Mm. So there you go. So Seamus, you had said that, you know, Thomas, there was really no signs, mm -hmm. you know, leading up to it or whatever else. And like happy-go-lucky lad mm -hmm. and everything else. But knowing what you know now, mm -hmm. um, is there signs that you could potentially be looking out for? You know, whether that be a, a friend, a loved one, you yeah. know, just somebody you even work with? Yeah, I mean, it's a person who knows somebody really well that will spot signs, you know? Somebody who's close to them. I mean, I say there was no signs. With what I know now, there was a bit of a sign with my son, you know? He did. I think I mentioned it earlier on that he stopped going out. He was spending a lot of time in his bedroom. Um, that wasn't him you know he would be out like in seven days he'd be out four or five nights a week not drinking or anything else but just meeting his mates and that sort of stuff generally socialising going to people's houses and he seems to have just stopped that for about you know, must have been a four week period leading up to Thomas's passing and that's one of the reasons why I went up and asked was he okay now I didn't know any of this stuff at this stage you know the signs basically are if you know somebody who's very outgoing and you know enjoys themselves and all of a sudden you don't hear from them you know they it could be a day it could be a week it could be two weeks check in on them ask them are they okay or even better still go around and see them knock on the door if, doesn't, if the person doesn't want to see you they'll tell you to go away persist ask them the question are you okay how are you is there anything you want to talk to me about? And then be prepared to sit and listen with no judgment because that's what they want. Because in that moment, it could be the first time that they've ever been listened to properly in their lives. And you're in a pr very privileged position because this person who is talking to you is telling them, they're telling you about how they're feeling. The thing with feelings, you see, things that bother me might not bother somebody else. It could be the smallest thing, you see. We all feel grief in different ways. You can be grieving over losing a job, losing a friend, okay, losing a pet, okay? It could be the smallest thing, but if it affects, if it affects that person's well-being where they're withdrawing, okay, <coughs> and they've stopped communicating with you, check in on them. Be a pain in the ass. Because just by asking that one question, are you all right? Is everything okay? You're opening up a conversation. You're willing to sit down and listen to what's going on in their world. And then you're in a position where you can explore their world, explore their thought process and understand how they're feeling. Another thing is giving away possessions. Sometimes people, when they... They've made a plan, they've made a decision that they're going to take their own life. They'll start giving stuff that they, were, you know, that they perceive as being like, you know, valuable to them. Like it could be watches, it could be clothes, it could be anything. It could be a guitar, you know, it could be anything at all that they cover, you know, because we've all got things that we cover. Um, another thing as well is the person goes silent. Even in like company. They're unusually silent. They're withdrawn. Lean over. You all right? Everything okay? You sure? Okay. Anything you want to talk about? That's all you have to do. Make eye contact. 
You can be walking down the road, okay? Somebody nods at you. You don't nod back, all right? That person could be looking for acknowledgement. Smile. Smile at the person. All right? How are you? Walk on. That could be the difference between somebody hurting themselves and not hurting themselves. Because we all want to be valued in some way in what we do. We all need that affirmation. We need that appreciation. That the life that you're leading is a good one. And you're doing, you're doing well. You know, we need that. We need that as human beings, okay? That's what we need. And give praise to people. Encourage people. Don't knock them down. If you start feeling envious and you start knocking people down, you've got to look at yourself and say, well, hang on a minute, this isn't about me. This is, sorry, this isn't about them. This is about me. What's making me do that? What am I feeling to make them do that? Surround yourself with positive people. Best bit of advice I ever had. Surround yourself with people who respect you and love you. Who like being with you and you like being with them. Who make you feel good. Who encourage you. Who express positivity. But also honesty. If you're going to make a bad decision, a real friend will tell you. He'll tell you the truth. That's important. These are all safeguarding measures for your own well-being. If you hang around a person who's negative all the time, you're going to become negative. In fact. But if you still want to hang around that person, ask that person, what's going on? This isn't like you. Why are you so defensive all of a sudden? What's happened? Encourage them to tell you, explore their world. By exploring the world, you find out more and more about that person. You find out, you know, what, what's, what's going on here, what's making you tick. They're, they're important things, you know. Withdrawing to a room, all of a sudden your children, one of your children, is spending more time in his room or her room, more and more and more. Go up, ask the question, are you okay? Is everything all right? Is there anything you want to talk about? As parents, I think we should be more open. There's so much stuff going on in the world at the moment that wasn't going on in the world when I was growing up. There's a lot of stuff, bad stuff going on. But there's a lot of good stuff going on as well. Mental health has never been so prevalent. You know, it's in everybody's faces now at the moment, okay? But we still have this ability where we store stuff, negative stuff. We don't talk about it. You need support, ask for it. Put your hand up. Make the call. Just ask for the support. Ring a friend. Because you don't want to put your family through what we've been through. And I don't blame my son for that at all. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know that we would literally break. But this is, this is what happens to you. This is what happens to you. When you wake up each morning, you can hardly put one foot in front of the other. You don't want to wash yourself. You don't want to eat. You don't want to see nobody. That's how it affects you. It becomes too painful to talk about. You need time. You're not going to talk about it straight away. You need time. You need to give yourself time to get yourself in a position where you can open up and talk about it. Go to the support groups. Help yourself. Listen to other people. Listen to their journeys. Listen to their life. Listen to how they cope. That's called peer support. Because you can't do this on your own. You're not an island. You can't do this on your own. You need help. So ask for the help. And again, getting back to the mental health side of it, you know, if you see somebody struggling, ask them. Ask them, are you okay? Because you know what? At least you've asked a question. One of the most difficult questions we can ask ask somebody right when they're feeling down and everything else is, is these questions. There are two questions. Don't be afraid to ask. Have you got any plans to hurt yourself? Have you a plan to take your own life? That's all you've got to do. I've been in situations where I've asked that question and the person has just let out a big sigh. And it was as if to say, thank God you've noticed. You've noticed me. You've noticed how I am. Because a lot of people who take their own lives don't tell anybody. They just go and do it. 
So wouldn't it be worth just asking that question? Are you all right? Are you okay? If you're not, you know, what can we do? What can you do? What do you want to do? Be open in your, be open in your questioning. There's no judgment here because it could happen to us. It could happen to me. It could happen to you tomorrow. We don't know. We don't know. So yeah, getting back to Thomas again. I think one of the signs was the fact that he stayed in his room a lot over the last, well a four week period. So again, hindsight. Educate yourselves on the signs. All the information is out there. Go on the internet, look it up. All the information is there. You, you've touched on something. Education. <coughs> Education and uh, being more aware of things. I have to be completely honest. I, Until I had my, my now wife, I was very ignorant. Uh, some of the words I used, some of the terms I used. And a, and a lot of people would use, even for, exa- for example, I would have used the term committed suicide mm-hmm. committed something people say when it's a crime or or a sin you know and it was only then when it was pointed out to me that's not the term that's not a term they didn't commit a crime they didn't commit a sin as, as people may mm-hmm. make you believe yeah someone took their life you know that was that was education that was just the ignorance of me that this is what you say and this is but, it, it, and, and I used to have this very narrow view that they were selfish and look at what they've done. But when I see, when I talk to you and I see the pain and the hurt, it's clear to me that Thomas is, was broke. He, yeah. he didn't, he couldn't rationalise. He, he, you couldn't have explained to him the heartache. Because at that point the mind was broke, the rationale was not there. Mm. It and, and this is the, I had this view, and I've said this. You couldn't have turned me in the field when I was younger. I was just like a selfish one. That and that's I just boxed that off. But the people now, and when we talk about it, and we say this, and you know, educate yourself. You you've talked about we we talked about mental health. We have talked about the signs and. You know, everyone knows someone that's been affected by suicide. Yeah. And and the biggest problem we're having, it ain't going away. It's getting worse. Yeah. The, we, we, we've seen the growth, especially here in Northern Ireland. I don't know what it is, and we could delve into that. But it's it's I think it comes down to massive education. More aware of these signs. More aware of... How to talk to people. More aware of the to reach out. How to reach out. I'll be honest with you. Until the last while and I've started trying to broaden myself and my awareness. I wouldn't have known how to speak to somebody. I know you're saying to somebody. I, I would be. If somebody cried in front of me. Or especially. I don't know why this is. If a man cried in front of me. I would get so awkward. Yeah. And so uncomfortable. I would actually try and take myself out of that situation. Because mm-hmm. I'd be uncomfortable. Why am I uncomfortable? the fuck odds well, I think of cried in this you, you cried in this when you know it's we we talk about emotions and, yeah. and we were talking about that and it's things we learn to suppress emotions we had we had said this you see a baby if a baby's happy they laugh and smile yeah if they're excited they're excited if they're sad they cry we teach them stop crying D- don't do that St- calm down we t- we the, a baby displays their emotion perfectly well a toddler Displays their emotions perfectly well. It's only in us teaching to hide your emotions. And why, why, you know, don't be afraid to ask the question. Don't be afraid to be uncomfortable. If you, if you, be more afraid that if you didn't ask it. Yeah. Be more so. afraid if you're having the what if questions. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid to turn around and say to somebody, are you all right? Or, come on out with me, we're going to go for a walk. Or, if you're not, if you are not an educated and you don't know what to say and you don't know, don't say anything. Yeah. Show up. Be there. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. sit there. Sit there, yeah. But I also think there's a misconception that if you ask that question because you have you think that somebody might be having them thoughts, that that's going to make them do it. But it's the total opposite. Yeah. 
10 times out of 10, if you ask that person, they are going to say yes. They're just going to be open to you. The same way as you're saying, they're like, thank God somebody's asked me. Because yeah. they want to talk about it. They they feel that there's, there's nobody there to talk to. But then once somebody asks the question, they feel that somebody wants to actually listen. Every day, I mean, I every day I wish I asked the question. Well, I was the same as Owen, you know. I mean, I was the same as a lot of guys, you know. I didn't know how to ask the question. I didn't recognise the signs. I wish I, w- I wish I knew what I knew now, then. But unfortunately, you know, that's not going to change what's, what, what happened. I'm not, I haven't got a time machine. I can't go back and say, oh, hang on a minute, I've got all these things I can ask, you know. I would rather be embarrassed than ask the question. Because it's me who's asking the question. I'm asking you, are you okay? Is everything okay with you? If you want to talk, you know where I am. And it could be a day, it could be two days, it could be a week. That person just might, might pick up the phone or come and visit you and say, look, you know, I'm not, I haven't been too, too well. Have you ever, look, have you ever watched the way women talk? You get a group of women together, right? They will talk about everything, everything. Everything's on the table. I work with a group of women. I've learned more about women in the last two and a half years than I ever knew about women. And they will openly talk about what is going on in their lives. Men, we go to work. What do we do? Banter. Oh, it's only banter. Banter, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm all right. Bye. Right, okay. So let's just get back to the banter because we're all comfortable with banter, aren't we? You know, we're all comfortable taking the piss out of each other and everything else, you know? But hang on a minute, there's, I don't know, there's this guy sitting there, he's quiet. You see him out the corner of your eye. You don't ask the question, do you? Because you're having banter with your mates. You're a bloke. We're all fucking blokes, aren't we? We're all hard. We're all blokes. So every, every, every lunchtime, he's still sitting there saying nothing, saying nothing. Then all of a sudden, one day, he doesn't show up for work. Right? A bit strange. He always comes to work. Then he doesn't come in for two days, three days. Right, okay. There's something not quite right here, is there? Is he okay? But we still don't make the phone call, do we? And why don't we make the phone call? Well, of course, it was none of my business, nothing to do with me. No. I'm not saying, you know, that you have to, you know, pick up on every single little detail and everything else, but make the fucking phone call, make the call. He's going to turn around and say, oh, I'm a bit, I've got the flu or whatever. Fine. At least you've made the call, you know? You're, you're saying there, Seamus, and I think it's actually answered his own question to me. We were, me and Sean had a look online and we were checking up the stats in Northern Ireland of suicide. Mm-hmm. And I didn't straight away compute it, but three times, three times the amount of men take their life than, than women, 75%. Of suicides in Northern Ireland is men, and I was like, I genuinely straight away was like, "Wow, why is that?" Mm. And we've just talked through it because women help each other. Yeah. I know that's a very brushed like answer to the, the. There's a more intricate answer, but generally, because men have nowhere else to turn. Yeah. And I think we, I, 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 and, I, and I think as a society, we have a long way. We're, we're talking about now. It's in sport. It's very prevalent. We're, mm-hmm. we're talking about this comfortably now. I don't think me and Sean care about anything anymore. We, we, we've opened up on this. We don't. We don't. Yeah. I don't. The the, 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 the worrying of judgment is long gone. We, we, that's when you get to a happy place when you don't really care what people, other people think. Yeah. But it, it I, I'm, I'm. This was one of the most heartbreaking stories we've. We've, we've, we've had, it is the most heartbreaking, not that there's any more than other people's, but it is heartbreaking, but such a poignant message, and I, and Seamus, hopefully we can include some of your contact details in this mm-hmm. for people that want to reach out, or we're also going to include some other uh, health services that, yeah. that uh, uh, you can use, but, um, you know, Seamus, before we, we finish up, for couples coping yeah. with us together, like you, we're so well aware, we don't know statistics, but we know the pressure that it will put in a really it, 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 it finishes most relationships because yeah. it just it's too unbearable. What what would you say to 
couples that are struggling now with 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 grief? Communication, huge. Talk to each other. Ask each other, how are you? How's your day going? Ask. In my own personal thing, I found that very difficult to do at the start because I thought it would trigger my wife. She'd break down in front of me. Do you know what? I'd rather have a breakdown in front of me than hold it all in. At least I know where I am then with her. She's expressing, she's telling me how she's feeling. Communication is key. It really is key. Support each other. Love each other. Put your arms around each other. Don't get into the blame game. It wasn't your decision. It was the person who took their own lives, their decision. Unfortunately, in this life, we, we can't save everybody, you know. We can't. We can only, we can only, we are only responsible for ourselves and how we react in different situations. We are not responsible for anybody else and how they react in the situation. If you see your wife crying in front of you, go and put your arms around her. Ask her. How are you? Your daughter, your son, how are you? What's going on? No judgment here. No judgment. To thrive as a human being, you have to learn, you know, you, I mean, this is my personal my personal opinion only, but I think you have to learn how to express your love for each other as human beings. Stop the bullshit. Remove the mask. Be yourself. And that's all. That's all anybody wants. Accept yourself for who you are and what you can become. That's it. And above all, love. Love each other. Well, Seamus, I have no doubt that Thomas' legacy is going to live on. And I, if I, if I could, you know, one thing I could say is I know with all the pain and the love, you're going to go and save people's lives. That's There's going to be people here because you've had all that grief and tragedy and and if if it and 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 uh, it's a small comfort it may be no comfort but there's no doubt in my mind that there's people come through to you and the genuine compassion the empathy that you have you have been to the absolute darkest side of it you're not telling people you're not giving advice and you're not ramming it down people's throat on how they should think and how they should be you're giving your version your side and i do think it genuinely, people phone up that line and they get you. I do believe that there will be people here today because of the pain you've had to go through. And I think that's a legacy on its own. And I, and I want to... Uh, the biggest thing about having such a prevalent issue like this and, and such a big thing is a pressure to do it right and to, to, to put it across right. And with your story, we hope that people listening to this it will help. It 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 they they will understand to a degree that people's going through that. They'll understand that there are different parts of this that nobody's expecting you to be there. They're not expect if 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 your partner took a couple of years or you're taking ten. Nobody's expect. There's no expectations of where you should be and how you should process your grief. Griefs we've touched on. It, it's a very personal thing. How people respond. You know. Uh, you know. It, it's. It's such a thing that we were we wanted to do and deliver the message right. And I genuinely, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming on here. I think you will have helped people. And I hope that if anybody's listening to this, that uh, that has any, that feels like that, that they would see that it's okay. Reach out. Yeah. They're, they're, you're, you're, you're now in that role, you're thriving in it, you're helping people. There, there, there is a future. Mm. And there is a, there, there's a way to work through it. Grief will never, you'll never get rid of grief. It'll never, you'll never outrun it. You know, people will try and outrun grief. They'll try and get busy. They'll try and do things. You never outrun it until you embrace it, until you realize it and admit to yourself that you're going to live with that and try and find a way. I don't think so, but there's there's things to help people out there and we'd like to let you finish up on something on, on, on something there. No, there's I something. just want to say, Seamus, thank you very much for coming on and telling your story. Um. I like to hear it from your point of view and I'm glad I sat here and listened to every aspect of it and in Thomas's memory as well, 
you know, I'm sure he'd be so proud of his dad for mm, 100%. everything that you're doing. I hope so. I mean, I'd like to thank, I mean, Sean. Uh, cheers, guys. Thanks for giving me, you know, a chance to, to talk about it. I am going to say that these are my opinions, okay? They're not written down. You know, this is just coming from where I am. It's coming from my heart. This is what I think, you know. Um, if it helps anybody, great, you know. I really appreciate, you know, the opportunity to do this. And thanks again, guys. Cheers. But I'm going to say again, this is, this, is, this, is, this is my journey, you know. What helped me might not help you, but you will find a way. You will. You know, you will find a way. And that support, you will find it. Just believe in that. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much.